And who is this order for? Lena. This is for Lena. Wow. Five, she ordered five chocolate chip cookies and I gotta go give it to her. You're gonna go deliver it to her? Excellent. Oh. Down. <laughs> Dial is laughing at you, right? You think Down. Welcome to the program on developmentally appropriate practice, or DAP, produced by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. This program focuses on play. Play, many observers have said, is children's chief business in life. Play is important for the physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development of all young children. Through play, children make sense of their world, interact with others in social ways, and express and regulate emotions. Through play, children develop their imagination and their problem-solving and pretend skills. Through play, children develop executive functions a set of cognitive abilities that control and regulate other abilities and behaviors that allow us to delay gratification to think and consider possible alternative actions. We intuitively know when children are playing. What are its characteristics? One, children enjoy play. Deb Leong, who has studied play for many years, has stated, one of the great strengths of play is that children love to do it. I mean, it's the most engrossing and exciting thing that they can do. Dorothy Strickland emphasizes the critical value of engagement in play. But engagement is so very important. Uh, if you've ever watched a youngster at play with blocks or in the housekeeping corner or playing over in the library corner and rereading a book that has been read to him or to her, they're engaged. Very often they're trying to figure out something. They are solving problems. Um, they, they are intrigued about what they're doing and they hang in there. Um, we talk about self-regulation. They have a sense that they hang in there, they'll solve this problem and they have a purpose. Two, as children play, there is flexibility in their purpose and in how it unfolds. The persistence, I think that's another really important thing, is seeing how children are willing to work through something that might be a little bit frustrating for them. And how, how did, what kind of resources are they using in order for them to be able to accomplish a goal? And are they flexible in their thinking? Are they able then to make those adjustments to their original plan that they're making? And, you know, which children kind of get stuck and need that support to get over that next step? And we've seen that with children as they've, and they've grown over the years, oh, throughout the year, with um, their, their flexibility and their ability to make adjustments. Three, children seek out opportunities to play, and in it, they determine what happens. Peter and Iona Opie, longtime students of children's play around the world and over the centuries, have said, as long as the action of the game is of the child's own making, he is ready, even anxious, to sample the perils of which this world has such plentiful supply. In the security of the game, he makes acquaintance with insecurity. He is able to rationalize absurdities, reconcile himself to not getting his own way, assimilate reality, act heroically without being in danger. Play is something that, that to me is so motivating. That is something that um, is their choice. Uh, they get excitement out of. Um, I think we've made a big mistake when we ignore play. Talk about developmentally appropriate play is the most appropriate uh, part. It, it just is. Four, there is a non-literal, non-realistic aspect to play. The theorist, Lev Vygotsky, points out that play is serious, yet not serious. Real, yet not real. Children use props in many ways, 
sometimes as symbols for other items. This is most obvious in sociodramatic play, but can also be seen in the pretend fighting of what we call rough and tumble or big body play, and in constructive play as well. Children know they are not building a real fort as they stack blocks, and play is not a stressful endeavor for children. They are highly engaged in an enjoyable activity and research has shown that the playful mind is ideal for creativity and the learning of new skills. Watch the following scene of two preschoolers engaged in play. You can see their enjoyment, flexibility, and awareness of the pretend aspect of their play. Well, uh, are you going to add to it? As important as it is, times have changed for play. In their home life, children are engaged in more screen time and programmed activities. And at many schools, play times are cut short to fit in requirements tied to sometimes inappropriate accountability measures. Listen to Leong share her concerns about children's lack of play opportunities. 20 years ago, children came to school having played. You know, they ran out in the summer. Even little kids were with older siblings and they played with other people so that they learned play skills that our children today don't. Childhood has really changed and children come to preschool without having very much play practice and if they don't get it in preschool when they go home they don't play much at home and I think it's a real myth to think that play will just spontaneously arise out of children really it's something that we have passed generation after generation of childhood the older children taught the next younger and as they got older they taught the next younger child so what you had in our society before whether you lived in rural Kansas or even in New York City you had this culture of childhood where the skills of play were passed from one generation of children to the next and that is really lacking nowadays we don't have that kind of situation anymore children spend a lot of time being entertained and so that's why play is really preschool and kindergarten are the last bastion for teaching play to young children the most important thing about making play happen for young children is they need to have someone teach them how to do it. Play is not something, as I said before, that arises naturally. It's a myth to think it just happens. And it's taught to you by someone. And if it's not going to be an older sibling or someone in the neighborhood that's older than you, then it has to be the teacher. There is no dichotomy between play and learning or between play and development. The two go hand in hand. There is an interplay of domains as children refine such skills as fine motor and incorporate them into play with manipulatives or sociodramatic scenes with dress-up clothes. And teachers play a critical role in integrating math, literacy, and science into play. Here are some comments from early childhood professionals about this integration. An unfortunate thing uh, that sometimes people think about is, well, if I do math, then I'm not doing play. But a lot of math can be learned through play, and even the primary math, when you're teaching a specific kind of math concept for five minutes or something, will enrich the play that goes on then for hours. So it's not an either-or, it's a both-and situation. Play is a cornerstone for how young children learn. It's especially important, again, for English language learners because it gives them this opportunity to 
make connections with their English speaking peers, which they have to have in order to acquire English, it, and it compels them to um, get out of their comfort zone because they need peer social interaction. All young kids want to socialize with their peers, and in order to do that, this sort of imaginative complex language that often occurs in, in dramatic play areas and play scenarios that kids create, that um, <clears throat> compels in a very natural way um, the language abilities of young children much more so than we would do if we structure a very formal situation for them. So they feel they put, they take risks. They take language risks so that they can find these new peers and these new friends in those contexts and, and expand um, their social opportunities um, in classroom, you see this over and over and over again, that they will buddy up, they will peer up, they will extend themselves in order to participate, you know, in some sort of um, enjoyable um, play interaction um, that, that kids just naturally um, gravitate to and learn so much from. Primarily because I see play as a very integral piece to how children learn into childhood, that I, I view play as the, the tool or the mechanism through which children are making sense of their world and that they really do need that time to reinvent and recreate and act out and test ideas and really construct their own understandings of what they're seeing in the world and what we're presenting to them. At the same time, I think that it is really critical that we integrate play uh, with their academic or their pre-academic learning and that I also think that the more naturally we can do that, the richer their learning is, the more deeply they understand what they're learning. So in terms of literacy development, we do have a, a separate time in our classroom where we do do some dedicated, targeted literacy activities with the children. And we also embed those activities into their play. And so when, when the children play restaurant in the dramatic play area, we put out all sorts of printed materials like menus and open and closed signs and um, you know, order taking pads and little, little spiral bound books for them to make notes in and take orders. We added this year, it's been very interesting to see how their worlds intersect with our classroom. This year in the restaurant play, not only did we add telephones for making takeout orders, but we also added a keyboard to simulate the computer so they could order food online, because that happens for some of them in their worlds now. Play benefits children across all domains of their development, physical, emotional, social, and cognitive. Different types of physical play help develop gross motor and fine motor skills. As babies move their arms, legs, and other body parts, they become more aware of how their bodies move and feel. They soon discover they can change what they see, feel, or hear through their own actions. Once toddlers master walking, their motor skills grow by leaps and bounds. They learn to jump, walk on their toes, throw and kick a ball, or make a riding toy go. Children carefully stacking blocks into towers are not only learning about gravity and balance, but also developing eye-hand coordination. And the skills and dexterity children develop during play carry over into everyday life. For example, after some practice, that tower-building four-year-old will be able to dress himself, to serve himself at mealtime, to pour his own juice, which gives him a sense of independence. Without adequate time for active play, Children may become grumpy or tense, not to mention possibly obese. Children want play to keep going and will engage in physical activity for the sheer pleasure of it rather than if asked to exercise. In the emotional domain, long before children can express their feelings in words, 
they express them through play and creative activities. When children have experiences that are hurtful or hard to understand, they review those experiences again and again through play. And in the social domain, as toddlers, children play side by side without obvious communication. This is called parallel play. But they also encounter situations where they both want the same toy. During the preschool years, they start to interact with each other by constructing things together or engaging in dramatic play. As they do this, they learn to negotiate, cooperate, and share. For example, when children disagree about the block structure they're building or who will bag the groceries when playing store, they're actually developing important social skills. Keeping things going and keeping them friendly requires a fair bit of communication. Play that transpires with peers is the most important in this regard. Studies show that children use more sophisticated language in dramatic play than in other contexts and use more sophisticated language when playing with other children than when playing with adults. In pretend play, they have to communicate about something that's not actually there. So they have to use more complex language to communicate to peers what they're trying to say. In dramatic play, social interaction is particularly prominent and complex, as Ellen Freedy states in the following comments. With pre-KK and even younger, um, I, I think they're there's, uh, there's probably nothing more important than sociodramatic play for that age group. And it's just, it's almost like the magic pill. I mean, you know, they, there's a reason they love doing it, and that's because it's good for them. I mean, uh, but they learn so much through sociodramatic play. If it's sophisticated, if, if it's it rich, um, and if the teacher's paying attention to keeping it moving and keeping the children working at a, at a sophisticated level, but I mean, sociodramatic play, as my as as our as our, uh, as our Vygotskyan friends have taught us, is 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 just so important for development of self-regulation, which is a an underlying ability for every kind of learning. Um, it's also a, you know important for social other kinds of social interaction and for language learning and for memory development, and the list goes on and on. The development of self-regulation for children is both emotional and cognitive, but has particular significance in making learning easier for children. Deb Leong and Elena Bedrova have noted that, although we think of play as the essence of freedom and spontaneity, it is also the time when children are most motivated to regulate their own behavior according to certain musts, restrictions about what they can say and do because the play demands it. And executive function, or self-regulation, is related to achievement, focusing one's attention to learn, as explained by Leong. Children who have high levels of executive function or self-regulation tend to have higher levels of achievement. And this has been borne out in other, other research studies by um, a lot of other researchers, researchers Clancy Blair, um, uh, Sabelle Raver and um, Fred Morrison, a lot of people have found, and in fact they, there's now the growing research evidence that actually executive function predicts uh, school readiness and achievement more than IQ or family background. So you see it can, it can be the underlying skill that closes the achievement gap. It is certain kinds of play that promote executive functions. In play, children are intensely engaged. Pursuing their own purposes, they tend to tackle problems that are challenging enough to be engrossing, yet not totally beyond their capacities. Sticking with a problem, puzzling over it and approaching it in various ways can lead to powerful learning. In addition, when several children grapple with the same problem, they often come up with different approaches, discuss, and learn from one another. These aspects of play tend to prompt and promote thinking and learning in the arts, science, mathematics, and other areas. Play does not guarantee learning and development in these areas, but it offers rich possibilities. And teachers can do much to make this happen. So I think that the Developmentally Appropriate Practices position statement really provides very, very specific information to help us define what play is 
and help us to use that information to in fact help children to grow, develop, and learn in ways that will be beneficial to them and their future uh, learning as well. In this section, you have seen and heard about the characteristics and benefits of play for young children. The next sections of this video program will illustrate the types of play and the importance of teachers' roles in supporting high-quality play.